you want to know the age of the land, look on the face of the sea during a storm. That was the advice of the famous novelist Joseph Conrad. And on a day like this, you can see what he meant. The ancient, immense greyness of it all. The waves like wrinkles on the sea's face. And the combing, creamy mass of foam like a tangled skein of grey hair. And what Conrad said serves to remind us of the timelessness of the battle between the sea and the shore, a battle that's been going on almost since the beginning of the earth. The basic ingredients are always the same. Sea and shore, rock and water, but there are significant differences which give rise to the immense variety of coastlines that we have in these islands of ours. One of those differences is the work of man. Now, whereas it may take the sea thousands, perhaps millions of years to make changes in the coastline, man can change the coastline in a matter of months, perhaps even days, and quite often he doesn't realize what he's done. The effects he produces are accidental. The rhythmic battering of the shore that you can see taking place at the Lizard here, the southernmost point on the mainland of Britain, is going on all around our shores. But in this program, we're going to concentrate on the interaction of sea and land in this area. We're going to put forward some suggestions as to why the landforms that we see are as they are. And we'll also look at man's use and misuse of this wonderful coastline. Our study area is at the very tip of southwest England. In particular, we should be looking at the coastline between the Land's End Peninsula and the Lizard Peninsula. We'll begin at the eastern part of the study area at Lizard Point. Here we filmed in a Force 9 gale, and in these conditions we can see clearly the strength of the wind. And we can also look at its effect on the sea. Obviously, in these storm conditions, the sea can be seen as a massive battering ram in which winds gusting up to 100 kilometers an hour drive great weights of water onto the exposed cliff face. Look carefully at these waves. They started way out at sea where the wind swept over the ocean surface. The waves moved as great swells over the North Atlantic following the wind direction. The distance the waves have covered is called the fetch. Follow the line of this wave. It's a crest line. This simplified diagram shows the direction of wave advance. And within a single wave, this is how the water moves. It's continuously going round and round. The effect of this is that at the crest line, as the wave approaches the cliffs, the water tumbles over the front of the wave with considerable force. The crest and the steepness of the wave front are important when we consider the impact of a wave on the cliffs. In shallow water, the crest plunges over the wave front and this tears at the material on the sea floor. This is described as the process of corrasion. You can imagine the effect of pebbles and sand mixed with the water upon the loose materials forming the sea floor. A second process, the hydraulic action of the sea, is even more powerful. As much as nine tons of water per square meter crash upon the cliffs when storms are raging. The water removes rock fragments from the cliff faces, and these fragments are themselves worn away, eventually becoming minute granules. This latter process is called attrition. So far, we've said little about the cliffs themselves. The rock that makes up most of the area of the lizard is called serpentine. It's an immensely old rock, perhaps 3,000 million years old, perhaps even more. It's an immensely hard rock. And yet, as you can see, 
It's been twisted and folded into all sorts of shapes, so twisted that that's why it's got its name. Men thought it looked like serpents and they called it serpentine. But hard though it is, it's been eaten into and cut away by the sea. And that's because this enormously hard rock contains a mineral that rots, that corrodes, and that the sea can eat away. And the result is you get the shapes that you see on this part of the coastline here at the southernmost point of Britain. 38 kilometers northwest as the seagull flies from the lizard is Land's End, the westernmost point on the British mainland. Now the rocks at the lizard were serpentine, twisted, bent, deformed by heat and pressure. Although Land's End is so near to the lizard, the rocks here are completely different. Just look at them. They've got a solid, chunky, massive, hard look about them, even though they are heavily cracked. The rocks here are granite. Now, granite is an igneous rock. That means to say it was formed by fire. At one time, these hard, solid rocks were molten liquid. And then they cooled, and millions of years later, here they are at the surface. They're very hard, and yet if you look at this coastline, you can see that they've been fretted and torn into fantastic spires and pinnacles. There's a trunk over there in the sea that looks like a cathedral. Now, how can that have come about? Well, if you come with me to Land's End itself, which is just over there, where that hotel is, I'll tell you. Well, now I'm at Land's End itself, with nothing between me and America, except 5,000 kilometers of the cold Atlantic. And it happens to be a very good location to show you just how the sea can destroy the very hard granite that makes up this area. In spite of its hardness, Granite can be attacked relatively easily by the sea and spray. The rock is broken up into enormous blocks by vertical and horizontal cracks. Sea water and spray can get right into the cliff faces. You can see how deep these joints can be. They're a challenge for the new breed of climbers who engage in the very dangerous sport of sea cliff climbing. Now consider the effect of masses of water hammering rock like this. The sea water is hurled into the crevices and the air inside them is compressed. As the waves recede, the air explodes, opening up the joints and eventually wearing away the cliff face. What you can see now has taken millions of years of action like this. Although there's some controversy about the age of the Earth, about 4,000 million years is the present estimate, but that's so enormous a figure that we can't easily comprehend it because human life is so short by comparison, here's a way to get hold of that enormous number of years. This model lighthouse is about 15 or 16 centimeters high. And let's assume that that height represents the whole age of the Earth, 4,000 million years. Well, all the way from the bottom here up to about there, there was no life of any kind on the Earth. Nothing on the land, nothing in the sea, only rocks and water. No life from there to there. Life started coming in here. But it wasn't until there that creatures with backbones started appearing. And where did man appear, you might ask? Well, if I were to pull a hair from my head and place it on top of this model lighthouse, that represents how long man's been on the earth, the thickness of that hair. 4,000 million years, the age of the earth, a man just a hair's breadth on top.
the two rocks, serpentine and granite, which we've seen here in Cornwall, are amongst the most ancient found today in Britain. As a result of the cliffs being eaten away by sea action, the coastline has become indented by numerous coves. Some of these coves are the sites of small villages like Mullion. Cornish fishing was based on small settlements like this one, which dates back many hundreds of years. Breakwaters and protective piers were built, and the fishermen gathered harvests of pilchards from the inshore waters. The force of the sea is such that breakwaters like this are sometimes damaged by storms and have to be repaired. Today, tourism is the most profitable activity here. As elsewhere in Cornwall, fishing on a small scale has declined since the middle of the 19th century. The main catch here, pilchards, was overfished and the village fishermen couldn't compete with the larger organizations. In ports like Newlyn, on the southwest outskirts of Penzance, fishing is still a very important commercial activity. Large, modern fishing boats bring in a wide variety of fish. One million pounds worth of fish is caught here annually. Fish is distributed in refrigerated containers to the Billingsgate fish market in London and to the continent. Road and rail links are important for the fishing industry of Newlyn. Indeed, one of the reasons for Mullion's decline was its poor transport links. Transport is also very important for Penzance, whose growth to its current population of 20,000 excluding tourists is closely associated with the growth of communications. The heliport is the most recent addition to Penzance's transport facilities. Before, it was the railways which contributed most to the development of the town. Penzance is the terminus of the western region services in the southwest and serves as a transit point for travellers headed for the Scilly Isles. Daily sailings of the Silonian carry food and other supplies to the Sillies. In summer, it also carries large numbers of passengers. There are also frequent helicopter services to the Sillies from Penzance. Helicopters are now also used to supply the lighthouses. At Land's End, the lighthouse top has been converted into a helicopter pad. The lighthouses are vitally important for warning coastal shipping of the dangers around this coast. As the sea erodes these cliffs, it reveals minerals which have been exploited by man. Miners entered natural joints and dug out minerals, especially tin. Tin mining is a distinctive feature of the Cornish landscape and has been carried on since the Bronze Age. Nine kilometers north of Land's End, at Botalic Head, alongside these disused mine workings, we can see a modern mine. The tin is mined from a depth of 465 meters, and at the surface, it's crushed. 100,000 tons of ore are produced annually. A byproduct of this process is a brilliant red deposit which is carried directly into the sea.
In addition to mining, quarrying has also altered the look of the coastline. Near to the Lizard is this vast quarry at Dean Point near Port Hustock. Notice how the cliffs in the foreground, produced by the action of the sea, are dwarfed by man's actions. Two thousand tons of basalt are taken away from the quarry face daily. Quarrying on this scale is comparatively recent. It demonstrates the power man has to alter the landscape in a short period of time. A much less dramatic form of erosion than quarrying can be seen clearly at Land's End. This headland attracts thousands of visitors and most of them try to get as near to the tip of Britain as possible. By following the same paths, the headland is being eroded. Just a short distance away, vast car parks consume precious space. The opening of a coastal path by the National Trust has helped to encourage visitors to explore the less well-known stretches of cliff scenery. So now we've seen, on a short length of coast between the peninsulas of the Lizard and Land's End, a variety of natural and man-made scenery. Coastlines as rich in scenic beauty as the Cornish coastline are experiencing increasing pressures to the point where some of the beauty is itself being threatened. <laughs> 